Hello and welcome to another episode of the Little Knowledge Podcast with me, Paul Busby, and as ever, Goff Morgan. Hello, Goff. Hello. Greetings to you. Hope you're all perky. Well, I'm not perky, as you know. No, no, no. You're you're a grumpy little bear today. I'm I'm startled. Well, Teddy is, Teddy is out of the pram. That's a little bit. It's just we were just about to start, and the camera decided it hated me, <laughs> it decided to betray me, and so we've, we're sort of recording this half hour late. And the camera is looking at me with great suspicion now. So we'll Uh-oh. see how it goes. I'm sure yeah, we'll be fine. But, but you're yeah. okay, are you, Goff? Yep, yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I do. I do need to. I do need before we go any further. I need to to later rest a rumor because people have noticed that during these podcasts, I swig frequently from this beverage. This is not red wine. I am not like pouring in two bottles of red wine during the course of the show. It is, in fact, a, a bottle of pre-made black currant squash, which I have in this. There we are. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you, you squashed that scandal before it could get started. Well, well you know, I, I don't want these things to get in the papers. I mean, yeah. come on. Now, you've got that possibly, definitely not alcoholic beverage, but look at my wholesome dad's army mug. <laughs> Fill up a cup of tea. So I'm the good angel and he's the devil. This is how it works. Okay, now, before we get started, uh, now, you've read this comment, Goff, because you replied to it, but there was a great comment on our last video uh, on uh, Llanarth, uh, and let me just show you a plate with Llanarth Court on it. There you are. Oh, splendid. <laughs> Wasn't that great? Staffordshire, early yeah. 19th century. And there it is. But we did have a, a very fascinating comment, I thought, on YouTube, because we both said during the Llanarth Court episode, oh, well, there's no tunnels. Oh, oh no, it's a secret yeah. Passage, Oh, yeah, it was blah, 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 blah. But we had a, uh, a fascinating YouTube comment from a, a chap called Richard who went to prep school yeah. at Llanarth Court. Uh, and he says, yes, he saw the stone altar, you know, that we pointed out. But it was the first part of an extended passage branching off into different directions. Sections of underground passages, he was told, that were bricked up so that the pupils wouldn't go down there. But uh, they would uh, occasionally collapse. Now, he was told back then that they were escape yeah. routes for Catholic priests. Yeah. Now, let's just say that what Richard heard was correct back then. Yeah. Um, of course, this is all the previous house, not Llanarth Court, but Hendra O'Bife, which was a definitely a Catholic hotbed. Yes. So oh, quite, yeah. It's plausible. Yes, I suppose it is really, isn't it? Yeah. But if it is I mean, true... It's always, I, I do thank Richard, and in fact, all of you people, who all, all of the uh, viewers who comment, everybody adds something useful to the story. And I, I really, we really do appreciate what you do and that adding in. Yeah, it's fascinating. I just I, just, I find that you know that you never get to a house that size with there somehow being a legend of a secret passage, <laughs> and I sort of, I sort of think somehow it's just little you know stumps of corridor that have been left over from rebuilding or you know a staircase that doesn't go anywhere because they shut down the room and it led to at the top and all this sort of thing, and I think the legends grow of of secret passages. And, oh, in general, you know, yeah. Anywhere, but... anywhere, anywhere, anywhere near a coastal area, they're smugglers' passages. Anywhere else, it is a, so I, I, often, I often wonder whether, you know, on further exploration, these things aren't, in, aren't really yeah. secret. And if they're... Just remains of, of cellars and buildings and what have you. But if there is but something there is in it. that, it would prove that Hendra O'Bythe was a far more important Catholic centre than I realised, almost priest running rather than agent running. Because uh, it seems that, very elaborate, if that's, that's true. That's very interesting. Yeah, if that is the case, that is it shows it is a significant area, isn't it? This is the fascinating thing that's emerging out of these the series of podcasts: is this, you know, this background of of, of you know pre Civil World War and uh, and Jacobite uh, post Jacobite Catholicism in the area. Absolutely fascinating thing. I never really knew. Now, of course, Hendra is something we're going to talk about. Hendra is uh, well, it's from the old Welsh, really, for old homestead. And uh, there was a time when you would have two in Wales, or some people would have two, one in the valley for winter, the Hendra, and one in the uplands for summer, the Havod, and the Welsh for summer is Pav. Yeah. Um, So we're going to go from one Hendra to another Hendra, the Hendra. The Hendra. There it is. How fantastic. 
you know, this is the building of which I know absolutely nothing. So this, I'm going on the same journey as the viewer today. I think this is what a wonderful place. Now this has, uh, it's called Hendra, but there's nothing particularly old about this because this is essentially the, the main Victorian mansion in Monmouthshire. The only real large full-scale Victorian mansion in Monmouthshire is the Hendra. Why have, they, why have they chosen to have such Elizabethan windows then? Oh, it's they... a, it, yeah, you're quite right, Elizabethan style. It's the Gothic revival. It's the Gothic style of the Victorian age. Oh, that's... It does look more Elizabethan to me than Gothic, but perhaps that's just me. Well, there have been three, four architects, maybe five, had a bash at this. It's been made in stages, so there's not one single vision. No, no. The Hendra does look oddly, the different sort of styles. <laughs> yeah, you can see. All over the place. It's sort of a rambling sort of mansion. Yeah. Um, but the what, place... it strike, what it strikes me, I'm sorry to sort of get it before you get you in your flow, but there's, um, if you ever come across any illustrations by Ronald Searle of St. Trinian's, <laughs> it, it does look very much like St. Trinian's, all <laughs> various little bits of hooks and spikes and things that have all been lumped together. <laughs> it is very much that. It's, um, it's near Rockfield, which is four miles northwest of Monmouth. So we're oh. still in this Monmouth area, aren't we? Mm. The last few have been Monmouth. And it essentially was owned by, the land was owned by the Allen family for many years. Uh, but what actually makes part of the, of the family's fortune that, that built uh, the Hendra was uh, an heiress inheriting three estates almost at the same time. And her name was Sarah Koish, and she inherited the Koish estate, the Allen estate, and the James estate. This is in the late 18th century. And she married a John Rolls of the Grange Bermondsey. Ah. And he, well, he didn't have much money when he was a young man, I don't think, because according to the records, John Rolls' occupation as a young man was a cowkeeper. Oh, God, because Lord. <laughs> well, he did remarkably well for a cowkeeper. Well, his due well, there. well, initially <laughs> in the late 18th century, the Hendra was a much smaller building and it was John Rolls's shooting box, really. That's all it was. Well, well really? Yeah. Uh, but the family had settled. They decided they wanted to make their main seat, now the Rolls seat uh, in Monmouthshire. Um, and so we went, went from a shooting lodge. And once they got settled, other generations of the Rolls family added to it. So in the 1830s, an architect called George Vaughan Maddox, who did a lot of buildings in Monmouth Town, he added a bit. Then 1837, a man we've already seen came in and added the Great Hall and other rooms. And if he looks slightly worried, uh, this is T.H. Yeah. Uh, Wyatt. The last time we saw him, he was building Malpas Court for Mr. Thomas Prothero. Oh, oh, well, well, well. <laughs> Gothic, you see. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, and he's oh, looking yeah. slightly stressed, so I like to think he's yeah. working on it and Prother is trying to scrimp a bit of money. <laughs> yeah. And we yeah. will see him again, because in the in a future episode, because he was yeah. the architect for Slantarnham Abbey in Cumbran as well, a future episode Gosh. that we're going to do. So, yeah, very... Uh... Then in the 1870s, they added a billiard room, smoking room, dining room, cedar library, and that was done and carried on until the early 1900s, adding bits... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Aston Webb did a fair bit of it. Now, he did uh, the facade of Buckingham Palace and the Victorian Albert Museum. So you can see as they get richer, the quality of architect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, they would have got to Pugin eventually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it smaller. So it's um, oh, in our gosh, Alami yeah. stock photo. So it's not quite hey. the rambling thing we saw, but there it is. Oh. Let's have a look when the wonderfully named John Etherington Welch Rolls lived there he, from the 1830s and 40s and 50s. He was the provincial grand master of the Freemasons in Monmouthshire. And you can see he settled because he became the high sheriff, the deputy lieutenant, the president and the co-founder of the Monmouth show. He and the Duke of Beaufort decided that Monmouth needed an agricultural show. So they set it up. And it's still going as the Monmouthshire show to this day. So it didn't take long for the Rolls family to embed themselves in Monmouthshire as if they'd always been there. Yeah. They were part of the fixtures and fittings very quickly. Yeah. So were they a Catholic family? Nope. Ah. Not this time. 
I was I was just struck by the the, the Freemasonry connection because it's very unlikely that you find Catholics occupying Freemasonic roles, shall we say? Draw you a are, hasty veil over that. You are, quite, <laughs> you are quite right. In fact, there's this wonderful little story of a later chap called Alexander Rolls, who was a close friend of Little Dyke. And if, hey, if, if you don't know who Little Dyke is, do watch our uh, our episode Three on Flither. Yeah. Three foot six inch master of the Monmouth races. Yeah. And Alexander Rolls um, had a friend who was getting married, but at the Catholic chapel nearby. And they tried to arrange that as this couple entered Monmouth, the bells of the local Protestant church would ring. And they arranged this on the quiet. The vicar found out and was oh. furious. And he kept saying, there will be whoever rings that bell, do so at their own peril. <laughs> and he kept saying it, and the bells kept ringing. And he got so angry and stampy, this vicar of Monmouth, but he couldn't stop the bells. So no, they're not a Catholic family, but they don't mind ringing the bells for Catholic chums. Ah. Now you can spot John Etherington Welsh Rolls here. Yeah, yes, yes, there he is. <laughs> Yeah, he's not stuffed in that corner of that chair. He's, there he is, in, in, the, in the oak parlour. It's a wonderful room, isn't it? That's really, a, that's good. Cool. If you ever thought you'd better have a high Gothic living room, you've got it, haven't you? But there are bits, you see. They've salvaged stuff from other country houses to put in this Victorian house. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one, the, uh, one writer on architecture, quite recently, John Harris, puts it this way. A great number of Elizabethan and Jacobean salvages were incorporated to uh, to set as a background to Jacobogus furniture of every sort in these <laughs> Jac- somewhat incoherent rooms. I love that term, Jacobogus. Jacobogus. Yeah, it is. It is wonderful, yeah. Jacobogus. Because, I mean, that the table there looks terribly Jacobean. It's, 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 it's lurching towards it, isn't it? <laughs> Some of the furniture they had was absolutely splendid, which we'll, oh, yeah. we'll talk about. Um, but what they did here, what John Etherington Welsh Rolls and his brother Alexander Rolls of Little Dyke fame, um, they love theatrical performances put on once a year. Now, I'm not talking about little pantomimes just for the family. They had their own theatre at the Hendra. And they had uh, sort of 1890 people would come. And it was always very seriously reviewed in the local oh, newspaper. God. Punch sent Mr. Pips to go along and make <laughs> fun of it. Yeah. Which he did, <laughs> uh, but they took this really seriously. The, the collection of costumes, um, it was said, could uh, put a shame to the cheek of anyone who worked at Covent Garden. So they really tried as hard as they could yeah. with this uh, with this thing. Um, but after Mr. Welch Rolls died, we get on to our main protagonist, really, of the uh, of the evening. This is John Arthur Rolls who went by the title, which he got in 1892, as First Baron Flangatic. So there he is, Lord Flangatic. There he is. Um, He did the usual stuff you'd expect, Captain of the Royal Gloucestershire Hussars, High Sheriff, MP for Monmouthshire, 1880 to 1885, Provincial Grand Master of the Freemasons, which means he was clearly a Lewis if his father was a Freemason, and he went on to succeed him as, uh, as the Provincial Grand Master. Mayor of Monmouth, four terms as Mayor of Monmouth, when you usually only get one. He was on the county council as well. Bred Shire horses, restored churches on his own money, and he was an anti-vivisectionist. That was his passion. Oh, how very interesting. That's quite early for that sort of thing, isn't it? Uh, He he pestered people very badly on this. I mean, he (laughs) sent letters, which one newspaper said, were almost blasphemous. Because of Lord Flangatic's passion against vivisectionism. Uh, And he started collecting things, uh, as did his wife, who was the wife of a baronet, a McLean baronet. And there she is. This is Georgiana McLean, Lady Flangatic. And she was obsessed with Horatio Nelson. And she collected everything she could possibly find on Lord Nelson. So from correspondence, she collected it. She collected, she had Lady Nelson's wedding ring, which was on display at the Hendra. Um, The sword he had at Trafalgar, but not when he was shot. He'd left that in his cabin, she found out. 
<laughs> so Nelson Sword was there. Um, and she's also, sort of early, pretty early sort of fan girl then, isn't she? She was a bit of a fan girl, <laughs> and she even would exactly. buy Nelson fakes. Somebody was selling Nelson's fake glass eye, which she bought, <laughs> even though she knew full well that Nelson didn't have a glass eye. <laughs> and so that is know. why, that is why in Mon the Monmouth Museum is basically based on her Nelson collection. This why South say, Wales has one of the great Nelson collections is because of Georgiana. I was going to, I was going to ask that question of the, the, Monmouth, the Nelson Museum in Monmouth to do with her. Absolutely was, but, she, but some of the things that she had. Now, uh, this is what was part of her collection now. Um, yes, it would be nice, some of the, the stories we've talked about. It might be nice to go back to Clither and dine with Reggie Herbert as he told the stories with Little Dyke. It might be nice to go back to Flanrumney Hall and have a look at that stone coffin that was walled up. Yeah. But I'd love to go back and poke around Georgiana's collection of stuff uh -huh. at the Hendra. Because she had Milton's chair, uh, yeah. Queen Charlotte's harp, harp, harp. Her husband, John, had an Irish harp, which had been found in a bog in Ireland, and he restored it. He had his own harpist that would play on the social occasions. She owned, they owned a coffee set that, that came from Napoleon's baggage after the Battle of Waterloo with Napoleon's <laughs> cipher on it. She had Bonnie Prince Charlie's dirk and drinking glass and a silk waistcoat that he never wore because he could only wear it when he was going to be king. Oh, God. Oh, God. Sir Walter Scott's walking stick. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Johnson's snuff box. Uh, yeah. A chair oh. used by the Abbot of Glastonbury. Uh, oh, no, that's, that's intriguing. I mean, they're magnificent. And, and a true horror. Um, a bust of the, of the Empress Theresa of Austria as a child. Now, this will give you nightmares. Are you ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 my goodness, yes, no, D and me, D and me. Here's the chair from the uh, abbot, and this underneath is fascinating as well, because this is a portrait of Charles I made with hair from Charles I. So there's a little no. portrait of him there, made out of his own hair. Well, at least... I know many things you see purporting to be the hair of so in her. I mean, and particularly, he would have been just, you know, Sean Bald every day to try and get the amount of hair items that are often eaten. Are you suggesting? I'm, I'm always deeply, deeply suspicious. Are you suggesting <laughs> that they saw Georgiana coming? Are you suggesting <laughs> yeah. that my favourite bit of all is yeah. somehow suspicious? I'd say because, oh, oh, this is disgraceful. You need to have more faith because who can doubt? Who dare doubt? The boot of what, Tyler? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, they had the boot of what, Tyler? What, with the Hendra. Boot. <laughs> People need remembering he died in 1381. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I was going to say, that's not exactly a 1381 human. <laughs> Most fascinating about thing about this, I mean, we take this idea of of collecting now very very uh it's very easy we think oh we'll just go on ebay and we'll find something or we go and so and so and we also we all sorts of bizarre things crop up oh, um, yeah. for people who want to collect local memorabilia and things but i mean where, where did she track down these things at this time they How did a did lot of her hands on them her and uh and laura sangatic did a lot of traveling but she must have had agents looking for items which well, she would track down and yeah, maybe they did see her coming with Watt Tyler's boot. But it's so bizarre. You would walk through the Hendra and there would be all of Georgiana's, you know, corridors full of Nelson memorabilia. Extraordinary, which you can now yeah. see at Monmouth uh, Museum, the Nelson Museum there. But the, one of the most annoying things I've read when uh, researching this um, is done by a real tease called Leonard Willoughby in 1901 when he went to the Hendra. And he wrote about Georgiana's collection, but this is what he said about her husband, John Lord Flancatic's collection. Now, how about this as a tease? This is what he wrote. 
Another room leading from here is situated in the turret. It is entered through a carved Italian door in the southeast corner of the oak parlor, which we saw a picture of, called the Chamber of Horrors, containing some gruesome relic relics of the medieval period. It is kept rigidly locked and but few enter it. But its contents are of surprising and of extraordinary interest. I am so far prepared to divulge, but no more. I am very <laughs> afraid that the contents of this secret chamber must go undescribed in these columns, and the curiosity thus doubtless aroused go ungratified. <laughs> so far as I personally am concerned, though I have inspected with amazement the contents of this room, <laughs> I must still, I fear, leave it as the penny dreadfuls would revel in putting it shrouded in mystery. Dreadful <laughs> man, ghastly man, Leonard Willoughby. Hang your head in shame wherever you end up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In whatever <laughs> glass case you have been preserved. Exactly. <laughs> Luckily, however, the Irish news, yeah. uh, they had no such quandaries, and they give us an idea of what was actually in this secret chamber of horrors. Um, <laughs> Lord Clangatic, who represented Monmouthshire in Parliament for many years, well, five, is one of the most popular men living. But lo, what a gruesome hobby does he indulge in. At the family seat, the Hendra near Monmouth, he has a chamber of horrors made up of a large collection of trophies and relics collected from the public executioners and associated with the names of the most notorious murderers over a lengthened period. It will seem that his lordship has made the acquaintance of all these repulsive officials, Calcraft, Marwood, Binns and others. And after each execution, he has invariably obtained a piece of the rope which strangled the criminal. A great oh. collection of these, properly labelled, with other relics obtainable in connection with each murder, go to make up the Clangatic Chamber of Horrors. Good grief, that is quite astonishing, isn't it's it? It's a bit grim, but it also said medieval stuff. So what sort of stuff would people collect and put on display that could go in a Chamber of Horrors, Goff, do you know? What medieval Oh, no, it's just, oh, God, you would be surprised. I mean, I, I, I had a, a wee look into uh, into this. I can actually sort of find my connection now. There are a, a surprising number of macabre museums out there um, telling you some of the strangest things. And in fact, one of the, um, the principal museum, if I can just track this down now, let me just find it. I think it's in one of the Eastern European countries which actually is a museum of medieval torture instruments. Med the Torture Museum in Amsterdam. So if you want to know what you would likely find in a sort of a, 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 a creepy medieval thing, then you would find your, probably, you'd find your stocks, you'd find your Iron Lady, your Iron Maidens and those other things like this, and, and thumb screws and various nooks and crannies of human displeasure, shall we say, when you would clamp them on people. Um, the, the boot was one of the worst... Um, sort of devices for this sort of thing, which you'll see these great big metal boots, which they would allegedly strap onto your foot and then put in the fire. Ooh, let me get this boot off. Let me get, this, let me get this boot off the screen in case people <laughs> think that what <laughs> Tyler's boot, which it definitely was. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we don't but want yeah, that. No, it's very, very, it's intriguing. But do you think in the, a lot of these medieval torture instruments and things were actually never used. They were actually psychological uh, Hmm. Torture instruments. They all will bring out the enormous boot. <laughs> no, and that would be it. So they frequently they were you would they were they would be a raid in a sort of a psychological torture. Uh, things like the rack and thumb screws and, and, and uh, clamps on your head and various things. They were this. So that was not one thing you would find in within a med with a medieval a horror music. But I mean, this goes on. I mean, you've got to remember the the tendency to collect. These things are all originally called cabinets of, of, of curiosity. Mm. So by their very nature, that people were, were, were bringing to these, these things, things that would be, were, were sensational in a way. They weren't the, they, a lot of these collections became the basis of academic study. Um, they would just collect things which were, yeah, curious, unusual, <gasps> the boot of what time, all that type of thing. And this still goes on. There are some wonderfully strange, strange little museums out there. Um, now, as we've seen, you know, that child's face <laughs> is hideous, but- Don't have nightmares. That still goes on. I mean, I, one of the most distressing one museums that I came across out there at the moment 
is the Vent Haven Museum of Ventriloquism. Blah. The Vent Haven Museum of Tru Vent. I can't even say it. Loads of Vent Act dummies. <laughs> Ventriloquist dummies. Walls and walls and walls of ventriloquists dummies mm -hmm. it's a, you think dolls are creepy you just look at one of the one of the rows of walls of vent acts of, in the in the vent haver museum in the in fort mitchell kentucky that is just like very strange and then there's the disgusting food museum in sweden <laughs> collecting various items of, of unpleasantness and the british dental association museum where you can go in and look at victorian dental instruments um, and see so if you get a cavity out. And of course, one of the most famous of, um, of these sort of cabinet of curiosity type museums is actually the Pitt Rivers Museum itself in Oxford, mm -hmm. in, uh, at the back of the University Museum, which was essentially the private ethnographic collection of one man, Mr. Pitt Rivers. And again, it's you, I, I remember going to the Pitt Rivers Museum and absolutely fascinated because not only is what is in the, the, the cases are displayed in a very, very odd way to our tastes. In that they are grouped by themes. You'll have a cabinet of lamps, and but in so beside you'll have a Roman lamp next door to a lamp made in Peru out of tin cans that have been collected recently. So they were they were thematic collections, not you know chronological or, or grouped in any other way. Mm. So you get these very strange you know juxtapositions. But also there are uh, rows and rows of drawers, and you can slide open the drawer in wild like as if you went into. Um, you know, the private collections themselves. And you would see that what particularly in it. And one of the, the things in the Pitt River Museum, which always struck me as fascinating, was the witchcraft selection. And you pulled it out, and he had examples of everyday witchcraft practice from the early 1900s in, in rural England. And some of the most astonishing things, including a bottle which is supposed to contain a witch, the witch bottle. And there it is. Mm. Never been unstoppered, sealed. Caught the caught the witch in it. No, it's never been opened. These things are just wonderfully bizarre. And in fact, you know, even though in one of the most famous witchcraft museums is in Oscastle mm -hmm. in Cornwall, the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, and it's got the actually largest collection of British magical practice, um, including ritual chalices, potions, talismans, um, and other items about ceremonial magic, Freemason, alchemy, Wicca. Oh, I'd oh, I'd love to go there. <laughs> I've been fiddling around on the edges of this subject to try and track down, uh, you know, various practices in, in uh, just out of, uh, uh, you know, everybody who used to do ghost tours and things. And it'll be fascinating trying to find that, to get into that room and see what's going on. I wonder what uh, happened to Lord Flangaddock's collection. It's not the sort of thing that you sell at Christie's, or, or is it? They might be. I mean, you wonder whether they did get, they probably did get dispersed and they have wound up in some of these various things. I mean, for example, if you listen, I, I, there's a, one at the Victor Wind Museum of Curiosities, which is another one of these museums based on a private collection of a curator called Victor Wind. And, and you, you look at the thing he's got, he's got dodo bones, two-headed kittens, living coral, occultist paintings, pop art prints, erotica, one off sarcophagus holding a 19th century human skeleton, um, and a caged lion skeleton. And you can get it, and it's you know, there's a, a decker. I love even like in the coming out through the gift shop type thing, you can actually go to their taxidermy decorated cocktail bar with specialized aces in curated menu of absinthe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? oh. So, Rickley, so it's possible that when the, you know, the collection was dispersed, it went off to other collections or into one of these museums somewhere, you know, that have all these various mm -hmm. things. The, 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 the most dis. Mm, the most unpleasant one I came across <laughs> is really very unlikable, oh dear. Uh, which is the, uh, um, oh, there we go. Oh, I, uh, I'm just trying to find the right name of it now. Oh, yeah. The Megura Parasitological Museum in Tokyo, oh. which is a, mu a museum of pickled parasites. Oh. So you can go in and see shelves of rows and rows and jars of bugs, including an 8.8 .8 .8 meter long tapeworm. Oh. And, I, and as you come out in the gift shop, you can get tapeworm t-shirts and <laughs> parasite, parasites in acrylic for friends. Oh, well. <laughs> so, so really, they're, they're part of a, 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 a big tradition, which actually is still going on, this collection mm. of extraordinary, 
extraordinary and grotesque. It seems to be something that we've always been fascinated in. You know, it's something that we're yeah. not just always interested in the uh, the other stuff. You know, yeah, it's fascinating. Oh, yeah, it's really interesting. Well, I, I hope that we find out where. I hope we find out exactly what was in the chamber of horrors. Someone must have written it down somewhere. And where some of it is today. I mean, we know where Georgiana, where some of Georgiana's stuff yeah. is, just uh, down the road in Monmouth. Yeah. I mean, the fascinating thing as well, I mean, if you want to see an equivalent exhibition to that today, you can go to the um, Scotland, Lab, Scotland Yard Black Museum. Yes, yes, of Which course. is full of that, you know, items associated with great and notorious crime. Hmm. And is now open to the public. It was a private collection for many years within the, within the police force, and now it's open to the public. Hmm. Well, well, the way it is at the moment, check, obviously, COVID secure, do that. Of course. Well, so uh, that's John and Georgiana Rolls, Lord and Lady Flan Gazak. Um, and she was uh, very important in Monmouth as well. She was involved with the Red Cross. She did a lot more than just collect Nelson memorabilia. But I'm rather glad she did. Yeah. And same John Arthur Rolls. It's very interesting, actually. That Lord Llangatic, he did have a, a Freemasonic lodge, the Llangatic Lodge, who chose the Rolls motto as their motto, and that is uh, speed and truth. Oh! Speed and truth. And not... Oh, isn't as, that interesting? Why speed? At this ah, point? well, we are coming to it. Well done. But uh, yes, let's have a look. Well, they had four children, okay? So we're, we're sticking with their family. The eldest, John McLean Rolls, played a mean pipe organ <laughs> he was a, he was a he was a barrister he was a, a musician involved in the monmouth uh, choral society and he was the heir you see john mclean rolls uh, then there was henry allen rolls there was eleanor who married how's this for getting more relics for your collection married sir john shelley who is the was the great nephew of the poet percy bish shelley so they had lots of Shelley memorabilia as well, manuscripts, notebooks in particular, that they had, and his glove, apparently. Um, so that made it there. And the most famous of all, the man who people think of when they think of the Hendra, is the youngest son, Charles Stuart Rolls. There he is, Charles Stuart Rolls. Handy man, because when he went to Trinity College, Cambridge, he studied engineering and mechanics. Yeah. And that's what he was interested in. So much so that he, uh, even when he was in Eton, he tried to get the Hendra wired up for electricity. Oh, so that's no surprise it. that the Hendra became the first house yeah. in Monmouthshire to be uh, electrified, if that's the term yeah. that I, I want. Um, yeah. Also, they had, thanks to him again, the again, very early in the early 1880s, the first telephone in the county of Monmouthshire. First telephone in Monmouthshire yeah. was at the Hendra. Uh, so he loved all of this sort of stuff. He was uh, a bit of a daredevil as well, was uh, Charles Stuart Rolls. Um, they thought that he might have been when at the age of eight, he basically hijacked a steamroller <laughs> and drove a steamroller past a window of the Hendra while his mother and father were having a house party. <laughs> so, <laughs> he didn't, not sure what Charles, Charles Rolls uh, would do next, really. Yeah. Um, when motor cars, of course, weren't uh, around, let's have a look at him with a motor car, because he owned the first motor car in Cambridge and only the third motor car in Wales. There he is. This is real pioneer stuff. Mm -hmm. This is when the motor car is, you know, first, first being introduced tentatively onto a public. In fact, his first car was a French car. Three and three, because you had a, a, a newish car recently, didn't you? Or a different car. I did, yeah, another car. Yeah. Another new car. car might be, another car, new car might be pushing it a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charles Rolls' first car was a Peugeot from France, and it was three and three quarter horsepower, <laughs> which he bought. <laughs> yeah. And he drove, he drove from uh, Cambridge all the way to the Hendra, which took uh, two and a half days. And people in Monmouth hadn't seen a motor car before, so crowds waited up to two days to see him cross Mono Bridge in his motor car. Good Lord, he, was a, he was a little frustrated because in those yeah. days, the motor car, the speed limit, was four miles an hour. Yes, and you had a little man with a red flag in front. In front he, yeah. he helped yeah. get it raised to the heady heights of 12 miles per <laughs> hour. 
but it, it was very tricky. Now, he loved all of this, you see. He loved cars so much that he decided that um, his father gave him some money, gave him uh, some money to open his own uh, firm in uh, Lily Hall, which was an abandoned sort of ice rink in Fulham. And he became a car dealer, CS Rolls Limited. And he started selling motor cars. Ah. But not British motor cars, because there was no British motor car good enough at that time yeah. for him to sell. Um, his dad put £6,600 into this. So good old Lord L. He did, uh, mm. he did help out. But history changed when Charles Rolls... Um, well, first of all, let's see him in just before all that happened in 1900, when two rather important guests turned up at the Hendra and Charles Rolls sort of forced them to try the motor car. <laughs> Actually, no, Bertie. you're close. It's his son. Oh, uh, I, had a, I, I, oh, I thought I had a Lord, spot Edward the Seventh in things, as you know. <laughs> yes. well, there's Lord L. Lord L's yeah. there. And this is 1900, so this is the Duke of York, later Prince oh, of Wales, later yeah. King George V. Oh, right. King George V and Queen Mary had their first uh, go in a motor car at the Hendra oh. when they stayed oh, for God. nearly a week back in 1900. Um, but history changed forever in 1904 when Charles, Ro Charles Rolls met in, the, in a hotel in Manchester, Henry Royce. And Charles Rolls loved driving cars and publicizing cars. And Henry Royce was a great engineer of cars. And it was Charles Rolls that suggested to Royce that they get together and found the famous Rolls Royce. Uh, the aim was to produce the best car in the world and to make sure it was British. Oh, um, yeah, interesting. And which they did manage. They did indeed manage it with the Silver Ghost, which was seen as the best car in the world. Yeah. And Rolls Royce started, so he got involved. Um, he broke the land speed record three times. Great. So a complete daredevil. In those days, yeah. it was it was quite tricky because there was no, as you can see here, there's no protection. No. There's not even a windscreen. No. So oh, you would yeah. wear what they called auto coats. Yeah. These heavy coats that weighed you down because you were yeah. going to face the elements. Yeah. But there was Charlie Rolls whizzing around creating Rolls-Royce and uh, changing everything, really. He, he yes. started the, um, he was one of the founder members of the Automobile Society, the Automobile Club, and all of that sort of thing. Um, Just one question, one question before yeah. you go on, the family motto that has the word speed in it. Yeah. Did it predate all of this, or did the speed get in after No, it comes from Charles Rolls, his personal ah, motto in the early days, speed and right. truth. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, and not, by the way, I had a friend once that said about the Rolls motto. There was a quiz in a pub quiz when I was in university. Yeah. And they said, what was the uh, hard question? I think you'll agree. But they gave us the, um, the Latin for it. And he, he'd gone to a Catholic school. He should have known the Latin. <laughs> and it was speed and truth. But he said it completely wrong. He said, ah, it Rolls, ah, I know what it was. Swiftly and with style. <laughs> and I said, no, that, that's actually the motto of Kenneth Connor's Monsieur Alphonse the Undertaker in a lower row. <laughs> <laughs> Not rolls. <laughs> he, also, he also broke the, Monte, the records, Monte Carlo to London record. He broke all kinds of records. He was an extraordinary daredevil. And it wasn't enough, you know, this driving around by the way his land speed record was 93 miles per hour initially it's a big leap up isn't it from yeah. 12 oh, good, yes. but charles decided to look upwards for his next daredevil thing it's oh. time to fly a balloon. Oh, the balloon he was one of the early aeronauts or well yeah. early 20th century late 19th century aeronaut he made over 170 balloon ascents there he is with his girlfriend, Vera. His, uh, his sister, uh, Eleanor Shelley, uh, she was a balloonist as well. They did once get Lady Flan Gattuck up in the balloon as well. He said he'd give me a lift home, and it was in a balloon. Landed it at the Hendra. I'm not sure what Lord Flan Gattuck thought, really, of the frequent balloon parties that his youngest son insisted on enforcing on him at Easter and Christmas time at the Hendra. 
because there's a very um, unconvincing um, sort of photograph of Lord Clancatic in a motor car, and underneath the caption is the motoring lord. And he's looking, frankly, a little startled and uncomfortable at being there. <laughs> so balloon ascents. Well, I'm up in ballooning. Do you know anything about ballooning? Oh, I don't know. I haven't. A little I've had a little look about what it. This is quite intriguing, as I'm wondering what this balloon actually is, because um, for much of its time, the balloon. Um, well, hang on, let's go back to the thing. But go back. The very first balloon adventure, we all know, is by the Montgolfier brothers, who produced a uh, had a balloon, flew it in Paris in 1783, November the 21st, 1783. My late father's birthday, November the 21st. I, f I should wish I'd known that while he was still with us. Oh. Yeah, so up they went, up in the balloon, uh, travelled 500 foot, uh, the height ascended rather to 500 foot, travelled five and a half miles. So that was the first manned balloon flight at that point. And the McGonfrey brothers were, it was a hot air balloon. Um, it was a sort of fixed thing. I mean, they started making them out of papier mache, of all things. Yeah. Mm. Um, but obviously papier mache could get a bit soggy, so therefore it wasn't much use if it got a bit damp. So therefore they then moved on to, I believe it was taffeta, varnished taffeta. Mm. Um, th this, however, was the second balloon flight of the Montgolfiers, but this was the first one with man in it. Two days earlier, um, you had the first live flight of a balloon, and the passengers on that occasion in a basket underneath were a duck, a sheep and a cockerel. Oh, uh, up they went. And uh, uh, one gentleman I, uh, on one of the sites I read today actually did a lot of research and tracked down the type of sheep. <laughs> oh, well <laughs> done, a, that man. Which was was a berichon, um, and a crève coeur cockerel, and a chalin duck, um, based upon the illustrations that were put in their papers at the time. So even though uh, hopefully it suggested they were, of course, and this was the first um, flight with life on it. And it, and it did have the first casualty, because when it landed, obviously everybody had survived, but sadly, the duck had a broken leg because the sheep had kicked it in the basket. Oh, no. So there we are. So the duck was the first casualty of flight. Oh, dear. Um, but what is quite interesting is that, is that there were a number of uh, people were attempting to balloon across the English Channel, which considered the first big step into, into getting over there. But the hot air balloon, believe it or not, for much of its life was not the predominant balloon because it was very difficult to keep the fire, to keep it hot once it was up there. It was difficult to manage height and it was difficult to get going. So it wasn't that easy. So the majority of balloons were actually lighter than air balloons mm. using hydrogen or helium. And that went all the way on. So these the first waves went, these went on for years and years and years, the hot air balloons. Uh, the, the beg your pardon, the, the gas balloons. They were not without risk because the first attempt to fly across the English Channel in 1875 by Palatra de Rosier, uh, he'd used a system which combined oxygen uh, with hydrogen. Easily not the best combination you could possibly have. Uh, no. And 30 minutes later, <laughs> that was the end of that. And sadly, they both died in it. So yes, that was so they were a long time, but eventually, yeah, hydrogen gas was used for that, but, uh, across the channel in 1793. Now that's quite interesting, isn't it? They're getting across right even at that point, really mm. very, very early on. Americans were involved in it. Mm. Uh, that was in again 1790s that they, they took off from a prison yard in Philadelphia in a hydrogen gas balloon. Um, so the, the hot air balloon. Um, by, by the time we get to about the 1900s, was not the most common balloon. The technology that was rocketing forward was, of course, the, the lighter than air balloon, the hydrogen. And again, as we know, they grew into massive blimp structures and they begin the first you know, um, transatlantic crossings and all various things, and, uh, but hideously wrong with the Hindenburg. Yeah. Um, and that was the end of the, of the, 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 the well, it's not quite the end because there was still um, things around which are technologically attempted to develop and make more secure but that's where it went but, but interestingly enough when we think of balloons now i know we're slightly ahead of it when do you think uh the modern balloon uh you know with the, with the burner underneath which we see today the hot air balloon was actually developed uh 
1860. Oh, as we know it now. Oh, blind. Right. I was thinking. But, wow. that was, but that is what made hot air ballooning work. Ah, right. Yeah. So now that I mean, have you heard of balloon fair festivals and whatever now, and they have those wonderful glows in the evening and everything, that is entirely due to the development of the butane burners. I, 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 butane, I, I might be wrong there, but the, the, the hot, the thing that heats underneath them wasn't until 1960. Well, the they year, had year I was born. Oh my goodness! There's a landmark if ever I heard of one. Oh yeah. Well, they had not just these balloon parties, but they had uh, sort of races between motor cars and balloons to try to convince the military that balloons might be better um, for observation and things like that. Yeah. But is it Charles Rowe's passion is almost becoming obsolete as soon as he's gone into it? Yes. Because, of course, he had to have a new one. Yeah. And there he yes. is yeah. in his uh, yeah. aeroplane. Um, uh, yeah. now, he was it's amazing member. how much the, the First World War drove this technology as well, because obviously the early elements of it were there. Yes. Not, that's what drove the this is This is, but yes, absolutely did. Uh, this is very yeah, early, of course. This is yeah. way before the First World War. There's, um, another, there's another edge in the development of this, which people frequently miss out with the elements of, of, of the development of, of flight, and that's the kite. Because yeah. throughout this period, as well as the balloons, there were man-lifting kites. Mm. And they actually go back into medieval China. <laughs> My gosh, well, wow. so there's lots of woodcuts of these things. Up. So there were even, in, or there were uh, for observation, which what they came, but they were trying to get the balloons to replace and take over as well. They would actually fly people up in man lifting kites with balloon right. baskets underneath. So yeah, well, all of uh, these things come together. Yeah, well, time is pushing against us. So oh, I guess right. ancient China might be. But the thing is, with uh, he, he was part of the Aero Club. And he knew Wilbur Wright, so wow. he went up in a in a, a Wright brothers plane. In fact, he he bought one as well, and he did start flying. This was his new passion, you see. This was his new passion. And you mentioned Goff crossing the Channel. Yeah. Well, yes, Blario famously was the first one to cross the Channel in an aeroplane, but Charles Rolls was the first man in history to do it both ways without stopping. Oh, blimey. Not bad oh, at all, gosh. is it? No, he's quite spectacular, isn't he? He, is a, he was seen as a national hero. I read yeah. um, a little account of, of someone who was a child at the time, and he said Charles Rolls was my idol. I mean, every young boy and, and, and girl who loved daring, you had this daredevil who was smashing world records, trying new things, and he was from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An extraordinary man, uh, Charles yeah. Rolls was. Um, and it was the 2nd of June, 1910, when he did his non-stop fly over the uh, English Channel. And he got back, of course, a national hero. Uh, and then on the 12th, uh, uh, a little, and then a bit later on, not, not long afterwards, he was in Bournemouth at an air show. And he was in one of his planes, and he was about to land, and something went wrong. The wind caught the tail, and the plane started to decline and he didn't have time to pull up, and it crashed. Okay. And Charles Rolls became the first man to be killed in an airplane crash in oh, Britain. Gosh. And Charles oh, Rolls gosh. was dead at 33 years oh, old. Oh, gosh. Goodness us. What he achieved in those years, though? And sadly, Lord uh, and Lady Flancatock were on the, mm. a train at the time, heading down to... Uh, they were going to get on their yacht, which was called the Santa Maria, and they were mm. pulled off the train and told that desperately sad news that their mm. son had died and the rr on rolls royce was always in red initially mm. after charles rolls died they turned it to black oh, gosh, in respect of yeah. uh, of charles rolls and they oh, put a statue of him up which his dad in with great emotion unveiled in ashen course square in monmouth yes i've seen that there yeah. it is yeah if you want an alami stock photo looking very uh, national hero there's that one. Yes. <laughs> there he is with his uh, with his aeroplane. You wouldn't believe um, that he is only 33, though, in that statue. It makes him look years older, doesn't it? You wouldn't think he was actually such a young man. He, does, he does look a little bit older than he did. He, mind you, he crammed a lot in, didn't he, Charles Rowe? Gosh, he did. He Safe to say. Hmm. And there, with, there is the Latin that my friend should have known. <laughs> Celeritas et veritas. Yes. That's great, That's great, isn't it? And that is Lord Flancatoc's uh, crest. 
um, he, he was devastated at the loss of Charles, obviously. And he didn't live too much longer. He died in 1912 at the age of 75. Hmm. And so his uh, eldest son took over. <coughs> the eldest son, you might remember, could play the pipe organ. Yes. Oh, yes. Extremely well. Um, yes, this is John McLean Rolls. And he became uh, the second uh, Lord Flancatic, but not for long. And because you, you, whenever you see a painting of someone in First World War uniform, <laughs> you immediately oh, fear the worst, don't you? Yes, yes. He didn't have to put himself in harm's way. He was 46 years old at the time. Oh, good Lord. But he was in the oh, artillery, yeah. very good at it. His men loved him and he thought he was the sort of dad of their regiment. Mm. Um, and sadly, he was killed from wounds uh, inflicted at the Somme. Oh. And he was dead at the age of 46. He'd never married. Oh. So he had no children. Yeah. Uh, the second son, Henry Allen Rolls, he'd never married and didn't have children. And he was wounded at the Somme and he died a few months before John. Oh, good so Lord. Within a very short period of time, those four children I mentioned early on, yeah. and the only one left uh, was the daughter, hmm. Eleanor. And there she is. Hmm. And uh, Eleanor took over the estate by changing her and her husband's name to uh, Shelley Rolls. Hmm. And so they continued the estate. It's mm -hmm. what, I mean, things were, were changing, of course. Mm -hmm. And in World War II, it became a girls' school for a while. The Hendra. Oh, yeah. For evacuees. That's a, that's a, yeah. An echo of St. Trinian's again. <laughs> absolutely. And I don't really want to dig too much into this, but uh, for a short period after the Second World War, it became a boys' school called Ardmore School. And all I, all I found on this is someone has written, closed in 1949, the head went to prison. <laughs> <laughs> no chance of trust me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but anyway, Eleanor did then take it back over. She had a large yeah. house in London where, where um, Milton's chair cropped up in a photograph I saw of one of her rooms in London. So clearly the knickknacks of her mum were passed yeah. down to her um, at this point. Um, and she continued it until uh, she died in 1961, and she had no children. Oh, gosh. So the line absolutely was, was at an end. In the end, it went all the way back to a, a cousin who changed his name to Hardin, from Hardin to Hardin Rolls, and continued on yeah. uh, until 1984, when he sold up. A timeshare idea went wrong. It wasn't going to work, so they sold up, and it's now the uh, Rolls of Monmouth Golf Club. Oh, lovely. so here we are. These are uh, yeah. uh, oh, golfers. Yeah. I'm not sure what they're doing with the rest of the building because they have a clubhouse, but I'm not sure what the rest of the Hendra is yeah, being yeah. used for. Yeah. Um, there's the hall. Oh, it's tremendous, isn't it? Oh, the pipe organ. Yeah, and that is the pipe organ that the yeah. second Lord Flangatic uh, used yeah. to play. Um, there's a video on YouTube of someone trying to play. It needs to be restored. Yeah. Um, but it's still there. Look at the size of that thing. Incredible, isn't it? And the hammer beam uh, roof. Hmm. Again, it's, 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 it's it, it, this was Wyatt's creation. Yeah. Uh, but really, if we're honest, it has to be said that when you think of, of uh, the roles, a lot of people think, that Rolls of Rolls Royce owned the Hendra. But of course, he was a younger son. Hmm. Um, it wasn't, but he did grow up there. And so his name will forever be connected uh, hmm. to the Hendra. So you didn't know hmm. that much about it, but uh, sort of a few pieces fitting into place now. Oh, you. yeah, it's, it's, yeah, oh, yeah, fascinating. I mean, I, 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 yes, it's, it's, it's amazing the size of these places that are, and these huge estates and the influence that people got out. And you know, Apart from the name Rolls Royce and Rolls, that was about it. That was the extent of what you knew was going on. Oh, his great man, Charles Rolls, was a fantastic man. What a daredevil! Yeah, I mean, if he well, lived, I, yeah. My goodness, if he lived. Yeah. I was struck interesting by you said about it about the cars and things because my grandmother was born in 1896, mm. and she actually remembers the first car. She remembered the first car driving through Cleon in Newport. Wow. And you sort of wonder, well, there can't have been many people in Monmouthshire. Do you reckon it was Charlie Rolls? A car. So I, I wonder, would it be a wonderful coincidence if it, if it was my grandmother had seen him drive in the first car through Korea? 
you get the, you get <laughs> you'll the never feeling, know, but it's a wonderful never know, suggestion. And you'd never it. know what Charles Rolls would have accomplished if he'd continued, what else he would have had. But you get the feeling, don't you, the First World War would have decided his future one way or the other. He probably ended up yeah. in the Royal Flying Corps or something. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. incredibly dangerous. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah, not a good period to be a young, a young man, or even a man in your forties. Yeah, yeah, but Charles Rolls always knew the risk, and he said he would, he would carry on. In fact, all he said was when he uh, got the record for going back and forth over the channel, they said, "You've done it, you're a hero." And he said, "Well, no, I sat there, and the plane <laughs> performed excellently." <laughs> like he was a bit daring, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, you got to give me. Yes, he was understating the case. <laughs> so you will never look at a Rolls Royce in quite the same way again. No. And I will never look at a chamber of curiosities without wondering what Lord Langattack had yes. in his yes. chamber of horrors at the Hendra. Well, if you're very well behaved, I might buy you a tapered T-shirt for Christmas. <laughs> that is an offer that uh, brims me full of joy in these darkened times. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Bob. And uh, been fun. thank you. Do uh, like, share, and subscribe. And any comments, do drop it below. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do. We do read them, and we do like them. And again, I can't say enough. Your comments add a lot to it. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And we will be back very shortly with another one. So thank Indeed. you.